workout ring. He is well, a very good right evening and welcome to the Bournemouth International Centre for the media slash public workouts ahead of Chris Billum Smith's first world title defence against Matthias Masternak. Andy Clark and Johnny Nelson join me. And I have to say, the backdrop doesn't really uh, tell the full story here. It is the worst weather that I've experienced in months. And all of those great <laughs> memories of being down here, even when we were here last December, all those great memories of fish and chips on the beach, ice cream, they're a distant memory. Everybody is coming in drowned. It is a, a very, very different environment. Although, I think probably an environment that Mateusz Masnak will love walking into. You, you know Poland very well, sparred out in Poland. Um, you've worked with Masnak when he came over and fought Tony Bellew. I think he will love hostile environment and he'll love the fact it's raining cats and dogs and, you know, it's not a holiday for him. Andy, I, I think this has got wrong written all over it. Wrong written all over it. Conditions are perfect for Masternick. The fight itself, when I saw it, I thought, am I missing something? Has this guy really gone back? And I was looking at some of his fights on YouTube and I'm thinking, he's still a danger. Why? Why would you do this as your first defense? Why would you do it? Are you trying to make a statement? Are you trying to, I, I just wouldn't do it. So I think, I think Masnek will feel so comfortable. Yeah, I've been in Poland. It, it, there's no thrills and spills there. And right now it's dark and wet outside. I don't think it's home from home. It's really funny though, because one of the impressions I get just from being around Chris Burns Smith today on Sky Sports News and in the build up is that actually there's not enough people giving Masternak enough credit. And I think Chris Willem Smith, one of the things might anger him a little bit is the fact that nobody's talking about how tough this is. I think if you're a casual fan, you look at this as a relatively straightforward first defense for Chris Willem Smith. Absolutely not the case. I mean, tougher than tough. I mean, what do you think about uh, Masternak and what he brings to the table and what Chris Willem Smith really has to be careful of? Yeah, he's dangerous. There's absolutely no question that he's dangerous. It, it, it's quite simple when you look at Masternak for me. He won the European title in 2012. And since then, he's been up and around the top 10, top 15, ever since, ever since. He was in the World Boxing Super Series, Series 2. He was reserved for Series 1, boxed Bellevue in 2015. In all of that time, he's been available for a voluntary defence, and no one has given him one. And there's a reason for that. It's because he's a good fighter. But I think Chris has done this deliberately because he knows that a danger in your first defence, particularly when you win the title outdoors at your local football club, and it's that kind of fairy tale. The danger is that you might get complacent, and there is no room for complacency here. He could have picked an easier opponent, but I think he's gone for a tough one deliberately. I know you still feel that that's not a wise thing to do, but that's what I think that he's done. And the fact that it's raining and it's cold and it's wet and it's dark, that will just mentally make it absolutely clear to him that this is not May. This is not outdoors at Bournemouth. This is different. Just before you start, I just want to say, you can see Josh Pritchard behind us just gloving up. Uh, one, sorry, Josh Pritchard gloving up Lee Cutler. Once they start throwing pads, we'll get out of your way so you can watch it. But just until uh, they're ready, we'll carry on. Can you talk about those names? Can I just give you some of those names? Dortikos. Oh, my word. I've seen him in the flesh. Andy has as well. You're talking about a monster puncher. Grigory Drod, uh, Kalenga. Just some of these names. They're, they're all very, very good names. The, 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 the play bit goes like this. You win the world title, you get a gimme. The first defence, you think, get me a gimme. Get, get you a gimme. And then the next one, you've got to do your mandatory. That's usually the tough one. Now, and most fighters think the hardest thing is getting a world title fight. It isn't. The hardest thing is keeping it. Because now your drive and your ambition, you've reached the top of the mountain, you're, you're world champion. So now you're thinking, I'm here now, complacency. And you know what? They may be right. They may want to put the fear of God in Chris Billen Smith for this fight. And the problem is, you're right, he will not get the credit he deserves if he gets the If you know boxing, you know it's a very good win for Chris. I don't expect that that's going to be the case. I think it's a mad choice of opponent. And so therefore, with the, the, with the way I'm not backing Chris for this I'm actually going to I'm going to really applaud him he pulls off to win because it's a big big win it's a big big statement let's take a seat guys and let's have our first look at the new partnership so the new partnership is Josh Pritchard on the pads uh, alongside Lee Cutler who fights George Egbenike, Ovi, as he's known, for the vacant English title on this Sunday card. Now, Lee Cutler has made the change from Kevin Thornley, who he had all that success with, to link up with Chris Billum Smith at McGuigan's camp. Josh Pritchard is the chief trainer. 
but he's decamped from Bournemouth to London. They live together, him and Chris. They train together. They were amateurs together at Paul ABC. Uh, Lee said, I've chased him my whole way through. We don't know too much about Josh Pritchard as a, a main coach. We know him as a very, very good uh, understudy to Shane McGuigan, but it's an interesting move, Andy. It is, yeah. I'm sure Josh has always had ambitions to be leading a corner. I'm sure Shane will have known that and he will have realised that at some point he was going to not necessarily need to let that happen, but that he would need to be comfortable with it. Obviously, they've, they've come to that arrangement. I am a bit surprised because he's had a lot of success with, with Kev Thornley. It'll be interesting to see if he's in the corner on the night and whether there's still an involvement there. I asked Lee earlier and he said he may come. May come. It's still early in that relationship. OK, well, you know, it's it's a big shift to make. I thought he boxed really well when we last saw him against Stanley Stannard. It was a technical kind of fight. He kept it on the outside more. He didn't really get involved. I saw him in a hotel afterwards and he said, I bet you were surprised by that, by the way I went about it. But it was smart. You know, he's, he's now in a position to fight for the for the English title. And if he feels that he can move to that next level with a change, then, then it's what you do, isn't it? You, you have the same trainer all the way through your career, so you know all about the benefits of that. But you have to be selfish. It's a short career. And if you feel that you can do better somewhere else, you've got to go. And that's a courageous move by, by a lot of fighters. I remember coming down here five years ago go with some friends <clears throat> I bumped into him in a, in a bar he said you're gonna you're gonna hear about me I'm like bought me a drink I thought who's this kid he's with his mates and, and every time I see him now he smiles I said he said I told you and, and I, but I just say in regards to trainers it's a very brave move or a foolish move uh, chopping and training uh, changing coaches uh, the brave move because uh, because the coach you're with, the one that's been getting you so far, you know, when you're with a, with a, a trainer, you don't want to upset the trainer because you think, you know, you've got that loyalty there. Um, or it could be a foolish move. Or he's got done what's best for him. Only the re results will, will tell us that. So we've just got to see how, and it takes two or three fights for any any union with any with any new coach. That's the phrase, isn't it? You take one step forward and two steps back with a new trainer, effectively, because they need to implement their... Yeah. Uh, I think they've had eight, eight weeks, which isn't a long time. And I suppose the surprising thing with that is the change has come after a victory. It's not come after a defeat. It's yeah. come after a victory. So you, you do... Uh, I almost applaud Lee Cutler a little bit more for that because he, he's made a move that he thinks will benefit him. But, but coaches use different language. Different coaches use different language in the gym, but di call different shots. Uh, they'll, they'll want you to react from different... So, so, apart from having to train, he's got to understand what he wants. And so it's when you're tired, it's when you're fatigued, when something goes 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 wrong mid-five, that's when that trust, that, that connection, that, that, that belief in your coach really comes in. Or you go like to Titan and think, you know what, I got myself here in the first place. You just wipe me down. You know, so, so it's just... It, it's a case of if you're going to have a new coach, uh, you've just got to make sure that you're going to do a risky fight. Make, give yourself time to get used to understanding the terminology. The English Super Welterweight Championship live here in Bournemouth on Sunday on Sky Sports and NBC's Peacock around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Lee Chaos Cutler. So in time, I think uh, Lee Cutler's going to come up and join us on stage here for a very quick interview. Andy, this is one of your commentaries. Can you tell us much about Kingsley Egbenike, Egbenike other than the fact um, he's known to boxer because he was in the original Ultimate Boxer, but he's worked his way up into this position on the small hall circuit, which is always to be applauded. Yeah, absolutely. I saw him box in Minsk back in August 2020. Al Siesta put on a series of fight nights there called Cold Wars, where basically the idea was that you, you, put, I know, was that you put on even matches, good matches. And Egbenike went over and boxed a guy called Sergei Shigashev, who was undefeated, vast amateur experience, and he got a draw over eight rounds, but I felt that he deserved to win. Since then, he's picked up a defeat, but he had a big win against Josh Ejak Povey last November, an undefeated fighter in an eliminator for this and since then he's been he's been mandatory we did think originally fight sam gilly but he's got some ability he definitely has some ability to compete on this sunday's card return of the king live okay let's just uh, stand back up here guys lee come and join us 
Now, Lee and I have already spoken in the last hour live on Sky Sports News, so this may be a, like going over old ground for you, but that's our first look at you as the new partnership with Josh Pritchard. What, what can you tell us, stripping it back, that you've done differently with him that we might see you try and put into uh, practice on Sunday? It's just a much more clinical chaos. That's all I can say. Um, much more, much more brutal strength, speed. I've improved every aspect of my game, and I just can't make the shirt Sunday night. Doing it under the gym lights and doing it under the fight night lights are two very different things. You've had the best part of eight weeks, which is not it's not as long as you would have no, liked. No, no, no. But in eight weeks, you feel like you've managed to get a connection there with him. I mean, it's it's a little bit easier with the fact that you're. You're in tow with Chris Billum smith It's not a completely new surrounding. You know those guys pretty well anyway. I've been watching Chris a long time and how they throw the punches. And that. It's not until I was in the camp how I knew how much I was doing wrong. Um, now a lot of that is corrected. I've still got a long way to go. Um, but I believe it's, it's enough to beat Kingsley. It's Kingsley's um, world title shot this weekend. But... I've got enough what it takes to beat him and then move on to bigger and better things. What do you know about him? And I, like, we get into the habit, I think, of asking, uh, you know, what have you seen that he doesn't do well? But what are his strengths that you have to look out for? Is that maybe a better way of looking at it? He just looks long and awkward. He's going to be awkward for a few rounds, I believe. Um, but after that, um, the fight's mine. The fight's mine to be won or lost. Um, I haven't really been thinking too much about him. I leave that to my coach. And uh, I believe I'm... I'm going to go on to headline here or headline at the stadium I've got to be getting through Kingsley if I want to do that Big nights in Bournemouth is something you're becoming accustomed to now you're further up the bill you get your opportunity on the live TV cameras uh, one thing I people could probably say it's a bit of a weakness of yours or a, a, like but you do like to fight for a crowd that crowd get going that Cutler Chaos crowd and you like to please them that's great for us we absolutely please don't stop doing it but at the same time it's Josh Pritchard saying to you look Keep it sensible. Don't let the crowd make you do something that you don't need to be doing here. Well, you're going to see Sunday night, that's for sure, because what I've been doing in the gym is it's going to be implemented in the ring. And um, like I said, I just can't wait to show everyone. I'm going to come out of the ring and everyone's going to be like, bloody hell, they've worked wonders for you, the McGregor camp. And um, I'm just going to keep progressing. I want to get this fight out of the way and then get down there early January just to start learning and improving and get get bigger fights I, I, I don't know if you ever get sick of talking about it because uh, it's your night you know yes you're on Chris's undercard and it's a big night for Bournemouth but you've got to be selfish and focus on yourself stepping back from that slightly big nights for Chris in Bournemouth are great for the whole of the Bournemouth scene and the South Coast scene so at the same time yes he's your great mate but you also want him to win as well to, to make sure big nights keep coming back here yeah, obviously his mate first first and foremost, so I want him to win on that aspect. But obviously, the more he keeps winning, the more the big nights are coming back here. Like I said, I'm getting built up underneath him, so hopefully one day I can headline these shows. Um, but I've also got to keep winning, so um, I'm just focused on myself, really. But as soon as my fight's done, I'll be sat there watching Chris and uh, knowing that he can do the business. I've seen him, what he's like in sparring, what he does to people. I think Adam said it on your... Um, on the podcast or where up at Sky so uh, he's, he's unbelievable I can't believe what they've done to him when I'm actually in the camp and I watch it it's mental yeah yeah. the toe to toe podcast is the name he was looking for yeah, the toe to toe podcast yeah. is what he was looking for let me just uh, ask you this before we go you're great with dates so it's a decade it's an anniversary for you today what was 10 years ago today yes yes um, yeah 10 years ago today I won my national novice title under 20 bouts I was just 17 I was a senior title I was the youngest in the competition at the time. Um, I think I, was, I just got to 20 bouts on, on the last fight and I uh, had to box every single round of it. And it was 10 years ago to, to the day. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, it's gonna be another win on Saturday night and another national title. Incredible, because you still only look 20. Look, I'll let you go, yeah. I, we'll go over to Michael McKinson. But thank you very much for thank coming you. on, Lee, and wish thank you all you. the best of luck at the weekend. Thank you, guys. See you, thank guys. See you, guys. See you later. Let's have a, a look here. I mean, there was a there was a minor swear word there, but I think actually it's one of the ones that we don't have to apologise for. But if we do, then I can only say apologies if any language came out there that shouldn't have. Uh, Michael McKinson. I'm a really... I, I know we shouldn't have favourites, but I'm a big McKinson fan, and I'll tell you why. Because I got caught in the, uh, the traffic jam coming out of the Vitality last time, and we were stuck there for ages. And a car was bibbing at me as I was trying to find my car, and it was him. I ended up talking to him because uh, I hadn't seen him after his performance. And he's made some changes. He's realised that on TV, you have to be... Just shaking hands with Ben Wick, because that there. That's it. He, he's so tall. The sun went out, didn't it? <laughs> the lights went out a little bit, didn't <laughs> they? Um, 
Sorry, as I was saying, yeah, I ended up speaking to him in this traffic jam. My God, I do have better stories. This is a boring as hell story. But what he said was the pennies finally dropped, that you need to be entertaining. You need to... Um, winning is all that matters, but actually trying to be entertaining and uh, looking the part doing it. And that's, I think, uh, another stoppage in a row for him. He's calling it Michael McKinson 2.0 because he's a very pure boxer, Michael, but not everybody likes pure boxing. Fighters need to, and I keep saying this, they need to invest in themselves. They are their business. Their business is the entertainment business, not just the fight business. The fight game has changed massively. You've got all these YouTubers that are out there. They're putting bums on scenes. Like them all over them, you're watching them. They are their own business. Now fighters need to understand. Yeah, I'm quite sure you could go to somewhere, I don't know, Tijuana or somewhere, you could see a fighter that's knocking people out left, right and centre. If he doesn't put bums on scenes, He's not going to get the opportunity, and that's it. So if you want to be a fighter that's a household name, that's going to make a difference, what's you've got to be your the, business. But what's interesting in that point is you don't have to be uh, the world's biggest puncher to do that. You just have to... Um, entertain. Entertain. But Michael's got a big fan base. Like It's not like he's not putting bums on seats. They're really loyal to the, uh, their, their own down in Portsmouth, and he's got that fan base. I think it's more people don't want to box him. You'd never choose to box Michael McKinson because he's a hard night's work who could perhaps make you look awkward and make you look silly because he isn't the easiest uh, to, to fathom out, if you know what I mean by that. No, I was just going to say exactly that. I mean, when it comes to selling tickets, he does that already. And, and I think the change of style or the shift in style will open up other fights for him because people do look at him at the minute. And if you're ranked above him, there's absolutely no reason why you would fight him because he's, he, he's that president of the Who Needs Him Club, isn't he? And so I think that if he's willing to risk a bit more, gamble a bit more, then people might look at him and feel like he's a better fight for them. But in the back of their mind lurking will still be the the idea that if they agree to fight him, they could get in there with him, and then just to win that fight, he could he could revert to, to what we've always known him best for, which is his slick boxing skills. But as Johnny said, you know, this is a business. You know, show business with blood, that's what it is. And that's what people want to see. I don't think he's made wholesale changes, though. It is just when to fight and when to get on your toes. And he's actually managed to get the balance right now. That Levin Morales fight, uh, which was a, a Facebook live stream that I commentated on, he was so entertaining. And yes, he was levels above. But rather than just posting to a point to win, he put his foot down and got his man out of there. And that's maybe the change in mentality. If you can close the show, then let's close it. We don't have to go safety first here. It's like being bilingual. You've got to you've got to entertain everybody. Some people that want to see a fight, some people that want to see a boxing, some people want to knock out. You've got to be able to to, to, to satisfy everybody for some way, some show, somehow. There's that rumours that bubble around about the David Avanesian fight. Now I'm here for that. I'm absolutely here for Me that. Me too. Me too, absolutely. I'd, I'd love to see that. And Avanesian sometimes has the same kind of problem as Michael in that people look at him and they know that he's high risk and maybe the reward for beating him isn't quite what it could be or they want a lot of money for fighting him so I think for me that one does make a lot of sense people want to see knockouts in boxing it's as simple as that we appreciate slick boxing skills and a lot of people tuning in who watch boxing week in week out they will do too but generally speaking the casual fan the floating more general sports fan they want to see people get stopped and they want to see fighters who are capable of knocking other fighters out and pretty much every fighter who gets through the ropes is capable of doing that sometimes it'll take a bit more of a commitment to that to that method but everybody has got that level of athleticism and the mechanics to be able to punch hard they just have to want to do it Chris Billum Smith is in the house he just walked past us and the first thing I noticed was he now carries a bag a WBO emblazoned bag that says world champion on it it must be I mean you've done it Johnny it must just give you that extra he's the most humble guy I think we work with in boxing a lot like Anthony Crawler in a number of ways like a real hometown uh, hero who's humble with it but he walked in there and I just wonder if he just even the bag yes but he looks like a champion came in looking the part um, does it give you that extra 10% what does it do to you it does so, so you've got People think the hardest thing is, is to become champion. It's not staying champion. Because your your desire, your drive... You've got, you got to climb Everest for a second time. Yeah, that's right. Your, your desire, your drive changes. So now you've got what you want. You're champion. 
And so now you've got to defend it. You've got to defend it against people that have been watching you from day dot before you even knew there was a potential opponent. So if you're a world champion, the best in the world, it means you've got to decipher a game plan that's going to be someone's game plan that's had six months a year on you, over you. Now, there's only a handful of champions that are in the world that truly believe they are the best fighter in their division in the world. And, and and the rest of them will think, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, you ask them, you know, are you better than the IBF champion, WO champion? They'll say, well, no, maybe. Chris needs to go into believing I am the best. It doesn't matter if we believe or not. And so once you start to think more like that and hold it with pride, and you believe you're the best in the world, that's when you'll see a completely different animal. May I ask you one question now about hometown pressures? So your, your, your struggles at home are quite well documented. Uh, get the impression of Chris it's a slightly different dynamic that he grow he grows here he never had that um, that night where they weren't with him and, and, and I don't want to sorry I feel like I'm digging you out a little bit here but it was different for you the hometown pressure uh, didn't work for you but for him here can that ever become a thing you know so, like he does now carry the weight of the the local community on him a little it, bit it, of champion. It, it, it's the make of a fight Savannah Marshall myself you know when you're at home and the pressure's there you think I want to develop you know on the under the under the in the, in the dark Chris changed promotional outfits and everything so he could fight here at home. He wants that kind of pressure. He wants that kind of opportunity to give something back. So some fighters fly on that. Now, now again, you need to be able to perform anywhere, not just at home. You need to be, and, and come back a winner. So if you're a champion, it, 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 he needs to think, like, I know I'm the best, but I want to perform here because this is where you'll get my best, the best performance. He's got a great opportunity, but eventually he's gonna have to box away from home, and that will tell, tell us the true, true, true depth of his championship uh, uh, material. Let's, uh, let's stand up uh, because I think Michael is eventually going to come and join us. So here in Bournemouth, it is my pleasure to introduce to you. She is undefeated with five Big Mo just uh, introducing our next contestant, which will be Lauren Price. So Michael McKinson will come and join us, and then British Lauren Price. I should just say on Michael McKinson, his opponent, Musa Lawson, was arriving at the hotel uh, as I was leaving. And I know this isn't the weather channel, but you've never seen a man more uncomfortable in his surroundings. And I couldn't blame him, because I was like, this is horrible. But it's his first time outside Ghana, I think, and it, what, a, what a culture shock that, that must be. It was raining sideways, it's cold out there. Um, so good luck to, to Musa Lawson. Uh, Michael McKinson is going to come and join us now. So, Michael, come and join us. We're live on Sky Sports. Good to see you. Um, the jet setter that you are, what preparation to go over to New York and, and training Gleason's for this one and, uh, and really hone your skills in a tough environment over there. What have you brought back in terms of what you've worked on and the whole experience? Yeah, it wasn't just Gleason's, there was a couple of gyms we was over there training with some real good prospects, sparring some real good prospects. It was good, it was refreshing to get away. New gyms, new people, out of my comfort zone, having it hard, you know. This is my 27th professional fight and I'm always developing, I'm always learning. I've been a pro over nine years, but I still feel like I'm getting better. So, uh, so yeah, it was a great experience over there. We're talking about you, how, you, how you're getting better. We were just talking through your last performance. Uh, and I told a very boring story about bumping into you in the car park, trying to get out of the vitality. And you wound down the window and said, I I'm getting it now. I'm getting it. You're seeing Michael yeah. McKinson 2.0. So what is Michael McKinson 2.0 and what did we leave behind in the first version? You know, I... Uh, I came into 2023 with a mission. People say Michael McKinson's a very good fighter, but he can't punch. But I'm, uh, I feel like I'm putting them, them opinions to bed now. I'm, the, my last two I've got out of there, uh, you know, getting that man strength at 29. <laughs> but presumably you must think that's a myth anyway. It's, uh, yeah. it's maybe a choice thing. You now know when to put the pedal down and, and when you don't, when you don't need to take risks. But it's not to say that the power hasn't always been there. It's, uh, it's a choice of when you use it. Yeah, my development over the last 18 months and my strength team and programme has been amazing. Um, you know, even my rise until then, until like the Ortiz fight, I was fighting better and better opposition every time. So I wasn't staying at the same the same level, I don't think. So that's probably why I weren't getting stoppages. Um, after the Ortiz fight, I obviously had to drop down a level or two, but these guys are getting, getting put away now. Uh, but for me, it's like, I'm excited for this weekend because I would say it's my first proper hard fight uh, since Ortiz and um, I'm excited for it. We never look too far forward because as soon as you start doing that 
that's when the slip ups happen. But yeah. we were talking uh, during your workout there about the sort of names that continue to be yeah. linked to you and you link to them. And the Avanitian one is one that comes up time and time again. So it, this is your opportunity to either kill that rumor or to, to give it some weight. Is that a fight that you are actively looking for? That's not a rumour. After my last fight in May, I did respectfully call him out. Um, it's no secret that that's the fight I want, but there's no no point speaking about Avenisian right now. Um, I've got Musa Lawson on the weekend, who is a big banana skin. This is a must win for me. He's unbeaten. He's 11 and over nine knockouts. A little bit unknown. Um, but, you know, if I, if people want to link me with likes of Avenisian and things like that, I should. Oh, well, I have to deal with uh, Musa Lawson in style. OK, well, we'll ask you afterwards. Just one on Musa Lawson then. What do you want to show us on Sunday night? Got to keep drumming that in, Sunday night, not Saturday. Yeah, I know, I'll keep, I'll, I'll keep thinking the same. I've said it a couple of times now and no one's picked me up on it. Sunday night. You know, uh, this, this guy, he's, he looks quite good, the few footages he's, like we've seen on YouTube. Um, fought in the Commonwealth Games as an amateur as well and things like that. But uh, he's relatively unknown and he's like it could be a very, very dangerous fight. So me it's uh, to stay even more focused than ever um, no matter what he brings I'll, I'll, I'll have a plan for it and I'll, I'll deal with it in style top man thank you for coming up and joining us okay. we'll let you crack on thank you uh, we'll right. hand back over to uh, Lauren Price and have a, a talk about Lauren Johnny what have you made of Lauren Price's development so far uh, as a professional undoubtedly undoubtedly a tremendous skill set that that isn't up for debate it's the transition from the amateurs to the pros and the speed at which she's doing it. What do you make uh, of, of everything that you've seen so far, particularly her last performance? Andy, I think this is where she belongs. Uh, I think she's so mature. Um, she's so no-nonsense. I can't see amateur in her. I think in 20 fights time, you're going to see the same traits that she's got. Uh, she's strong, aggressive, and bullish, given the chance. And she wants to fight. In and out of the ring, she's, she's the same character. Um, I actually think, you know what, some people are made to be pros. And if you, you've been gifted to be a good amateur, as well, in a, as, as well as a good pro, then you're laughing. But some people are good at one or the other. And most people are only good at one or the other. She will be in a position where you'll see a flourish, get better and better and better and better. Pro suits her down to the ground. She, we're, get, we're getting up again, guys, straight up. And now we move from one undefeated Olympian Lauren, to another. Come and, come and join us live on Sky Sports. Uh, how is everything? Uh, preparation for this one. I think we're looking forward to this. Sylvia Borto, she brings quite a lot to the table. Um, she's been in there with some very good fighters, up and down the weights, it has to be said. But we think she's going to give you quite a good workout, uh, or certainly a test at the weekend. Yeah, obviously, um, watch the last fight against Michaela Mayer. Uh, even though Mayer, you know, won the full 10 rounds, it was competitive. Um, she's been European champion at a lower weight before. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I've had a great camp and I just want to, you know, get out, show my skill and put on a top performance. I might ask you to come in because we were just talking, uh, you, you couldn't hear what we were saying, but Johnny was just talking about how he feels very much, well, you can say it, how very much he feels that you're at home in the pros. In, 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 my, in my head, I think there's, there's not many fighters that are good amateurs and good pros. And, and you've been gifted to be a, a good amateur, but I think the pro game suits you down to the ground. Do you feel? Do you feel? Do you feel the? Do you, do you feel the benefits of it? Do you think that? Do you think that is the case? Yeah, I think obviously it's, it's obviously the first year you're just getting used to the you know the the big nights and stuff like that. But I felt like in my last couple of fights now I've settled down. Um, don't get me wrong, I keep improving all the time. I still got a lot of learning to do, but. Yeah, as an amateur, I've come across every style in the world. And um, going into the pros, you know, they, they, they seem to be a lot more, I'd say, tougher and stronger and more grit, but not as technical in a way. But I believe, obviously, like my skill and stuff like that does does come out on top. And I feel like I'm settling in down nicely now into the 10 rounds as well. And the argument on Rob Ballon, are you a, a, an advocate for the two-minute round, uh, two rounds or three-minute rounds? Well, I train... Apart from this week, I've been sparring like eight threes, ten threes uh, in the gym. And th I'm against, you know, the top GB girls as well who are going to the Olympics this year. I'm, I'm doing like four rounds of one, four rounds of another, so fresh ones as well. And I'm feeling good. Um, but, you know, it's an odd one because at the minute, obviously, I think 
I, I was listening to the um, discussion last week when Megan and Jonas had the press conference and you had Matthew on here as well and he was saying about the two minutes, he was saying about the three minutes and I think it's if you weigh it up, it's, it's an odd one because I think a lot of the elite girls could do the three minutes but I don't know if the pool is big enough yet for them kind of, for, for enough fights at three minutes because there's a bit in between, I think, the other girls, I think, at the minute, because it's two minutes, it's exciting and it's fast and they can deal with that. Whereas if it goes three minutes, I don't know whether the, the public, the people will, you know, be, I don't know, be, like, be bored in You don't a way. think it showcases your skills more? Yeah. yeah? I, I, um, for the elite ones, yeah, I think you have a little bit more time as well to settle down and settle into the fight, whereas two minutes go really fast. But my argument is, is there enough elite fighters in the pros at the minute? May I ask you before you go? Now, this is not you at all. Don't do a lot of calling out. So we can't, we kind of do it for you and end up putting words in your mouth. But it's rumbling around now, and it's your platform. Yeah. The winner of Jonas That's against Maya. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, you know, this fight, obviously, I, I've been, it's my sixth professional fight now. I turned over as Olympic gold medalist. Everyone was like, oh, I wanted to move fast. I believe in myself. Rob McCracken believes in me. I know what I can do, and I believe, you know, I won the winner of that fight. Whoever wins, Mayor or Jonas, um, I, I'd like that fight next. Obviously, no looking past. Still uh, water, yeah. Yeah, on, on Sunday, I want to go in, good performance. And then my main focus in 2024, I want to be chasing them world titles. I believe, you know, I beat Jonas, I beat Mayor now. But, that, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm 29, I'm fit, I'm, you know, in my prime. And uh, I don't want to wait around, I just want to go out there. I believe how good I am, and I believe that I'll get the wins who got them world titles at well, the weight at the minute, whether it's Jonas, Mayer, Sandy, Jessica McCaskill. Um, I believe in myself, and I believe I beat them all. Wow. Okay, you don't usually do it, and then you've done it all at once. <laughs> I don't usually do it, but you know me, I'm laid back, and you know, I'm kind of, I don't say a lot. Yeah. But. That means know, that when you say it, it really may, means I'm something. A bit in a way, right, my name's not really getting mentioned. You were asking the questions or saying, mentioning my name, Lauren Price, but no one's coming back. They're either saying Sandy Ryan or Jess McCaskill or now they're saying Chantal Cameron or Katie Taylor. You think that's on purpose? In a different way. And in a way, I can't blame them because I haven't really got anything to offer them as I haven't got a world title, but I'm an Olympic gold medalist. And when I turned over, that was the ambition. I want to chase them world titles. And I'm ready. And I said on the interview the other day, there's a new kid on the block, and that's what I want. Brilliant. What a response. There you go. Amazing. You've absolutely fooled me there. Brilliant. OK, look, I'll let you get back, because uh, Ben Wick is just about to start punching holes in Sugar Hill. But thank you very much for coming and joining us. There you go. What a message. Are you having that? <laughs> what a message. I like that. Yeah. I like that. And she's right. And the thing is, they are conveniently not talking about her. They're looking in the, in the opposite direction. Trust me. That's what, that's what that is all about. That's what he's up there. They're conveniently going to look in the opposite direction yeah. because they don't want any of that. But I would also say, it's the entertainment business, professional sport. Lauren Price has to talk herself up if nobody else is doing it. You, ha you have to be the first one to do it. Um, but wow, what an answer. There you go. Clip that up. Get that up on the internet. I bet There's you, your war cry. And I bet you none of them will respond. They might give it a line. Oh, I don't know, mate. Once the Sky Sports machine gets going <laughs> and we tag everybody in it, that'll be... That'll be it. Um, I can say that Ben Shalom, promoter, has joined me now. You must be delighted. Finally, we are seeing Ben Whitaker punching and back and smiling. Rather than doing all of the entertainment that we've seen him do off camera and all the great interviews, <laughs> all the great interviews, to see him back punching, back where you wanted to see him, the reason you signed him, you must be over the moon. Yeah, it's been a frustrating time for everyone. You know, he's one of our biggest signings. Um, we were in Bournemouth, what, 18 months ago now, one of the best debuts I've ever seen. Genuinely amazing, and uh, he lit the boxing world alight that night, and everyone saw, wow, I, the, the amount of messages I received, the amount of texts, the emails, you got a star on your hands there, Ben. We know we have a star, and it's just about activity, and it's just about regular work, and it's been a frustrating time for him. He came, I think, he came into the professional sport slightly injured, sli having to deal with a few things. He's, he's taken his time out. He's been mature about it. He, he wants to have a huge, huge future in the sport. And so he, he wanted to get rid of all his problems early on. He's taken that time. And to see him back in there with Joby Clayton now, 
it's a special side because it's something we've been waiting for for a long time. He's going to have a massive year next year, and I'm hoping for a. For a yeah, second. yeah. When he turned over, all the talk was going super quick. And do you think if we had our time again, that maybe it would be to change the narrative a little bit of grow into the pros? You don't need to rush, or is that just taking him away from his uh, his nature? His nature is to to talk the talk. Uh, maybe the body let him down a little bit, but you don't want to kind of coach that out of him. You want him to be abrasive. You want him to upset people. You want him to be outspoken. Yeah, I think, look, when you're an elite athlete, he knows his level. You know, people talk him about being a novice fighter. He's been around Europe. He's been around the world. He's fought the very, very best fighters in his category. And when he sees guys winning the British title, European title, even world titles, and he knows but in his head he has their number, he's going to talk about that. He's going to call them out. But, yeah, of course, we want to build a star. We'd like to take it slowly. I think when he went to Saudi after his debut, it probably was a wrong move. He was so eager to get out very quickly and uh, and he was struggling with something. But thankfully, those days are behind us now. It's like having a brand new signing. I think when we're looking, I've said it many times, there's many stars coming towards their end of career. Those have carried the sport for a long, long time. You have to look at the future and you have to look at the stars that are going to carry this sport for the next five, ten years. I believe he's top of the list. I really do. So it's great to have him back. Thanks, Ben. Let's have a quick word with Andy Clark. I mean, he, he, he is an incredible natural talent, uh, Ben Whitaker. He's also very Marmite because some people just simply do not like the way he goes about his business. But from someone that's covered him from, from pole to flag almost, from his amateur days through to now, I, I, I want to know, is he, he's always been this way, presumably. It doesn't matter if it's a world-class Russian or Kazakh um, or Uzbek. He's always been the same. Yeah, he has. He has. He's, he's always been the same. And, and I don't really have any problem with it at all. I, I never have had, even with fighters who, personality-wise or persona-wise, I didn't really take to. I found it easy to separate that from my admiration for them as, as a fighter. But with Whitaker, you know, his amateur career was sensational, to be honest, because it wasn't just the Olympic silver medal he medaled in other major competitions but I first saw him at the world championships and the European championships in 2017 when he was 19 and he got to the quarterfinals of both and he was boxing Alexander Kishniak a Ukrainian who so nearly won gold at the last Olympics an absolutely supersonic amateur so he's been right up there for such a long time what I really like about him though is that when you talk to him away from the cameras he understands what boxing is he understands that that punch that you don't see that can turn your lights out, that can happen to anyone. He understands that at some point in his career, he is going to get knocked down. He does drills which he copied from the Cuban amateurs where he'll replicate getting knocked down, spinning around on the floor, rolling around on the floor to disorientate himself, get back up and then get on the pads to see if he can hold his coordination together. Things like that. And that just speaks to someone who has a realistic appreciation of what can happen in there. And that's absolutely crucial because no matter how confident and flashy you are, if you go in there with the idea in your head that you can't be hurt, that none of these things can ever happen to you, on the night you, you can be resolute that it won't, but you need to know that it can. Yeah. And, and he has that. From, from, a man that. from a man that spent years in the gym next to Prince Nassim Hamed, who was the master of, of absolutely the ultimate showman. You, can you what see elements of Naz in Ben Whitaker? Now, ben before Wicker. I get everyone upset about saying that he's going to match what Naz did, I'm talking about as a character and what he does. He understands the business, uh, as Andy was saying, in and out. He, under, he understands, really understands the business. There's not many fighters that really understand the business. It's not just about the stars and, and, and the lights are on. You've got to understand the downtimes as well, and he gets it. And that's, that's, that's why I recognise Stardust. I recognise it from, from day one when he was boxing. Look at you. Welcome back. You must be over the moon. Finally, we can see you in your, we'll your natural we'll habitat of being a professional yeah. fighter. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to just talk about it. You're doing it now. You've got the smile. Exactly, um, presumably, exactly. it's a happy camp and a happy fighter. Of course. Of course. I had a nice little carrot cake before I came, so I had to just burn it off real quick in there. But yeah, um, back to it Sunday. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Fully fit as well. That must be a relief. Well, yeah, I'm built like the Tin Man at the moment. Just keep falling apart, but... Hopefully things things go right after Sunday and then we move into the next year, the active year. How frustrating has that been? Have you, and have you been able to put your finger on why you... It's just let you down when you wanted to build momentum, effectively. No, yeah. Nothing major, just lots of niggly little injuries. I must have stepped on the wrong penny or something, man. It's just all striking me at once. But uh, at the end of the day, my spirits are still high. I've still been training, still been working hard. 
And if you see my recent picture, I'm in great shape. So it's not like I'm just sitting on the couch eating like an idiot. I'm working hard. So you'll, you'll see it Sunday. Then hopefully uh, 2024, a big year for me. Yeah, hopefully. Yep. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the injury curse yeah. is behind you. Yeah, yeah. With that in mind, though, turning every negative into a positive, has it meant that you can just do more with Sugar Hill and continue to, you know, it takes time to build a relationship and an understanding. You haven't been out of the gym. Yeah. Is that one way of looking at it? You've been able yeah. to forge a bit more of a partnership? 100%, then? yeah, 100%. When you go back to back in camps, you're working for the fight sometimes, so you don't really get that time to slow it down, work on your mistakes, work on what's wrong. For me, I know what I can do right. This is what I can add to the game, what I can make better, and that's what we've been working on. And uh, we've had that big block to slow things down, really work on it. Been sparring, sometimes it'll be a slow technical spar, but I'm working on things. You know, when we got the day, all we did was just pick it up a little bit, so I'm ready to go. I remember your debut press conference where, I mean, everyone was catching strays. Yeah. Let's be honest. Had your mentality changed at all with 2024 and the hopefully injuries are behind you now? Will you have a different mentality to build towards a big fight or is it still, look, once the hand breaks off, it doesn't really matter? Yeah, for me, I'm looking up, not down. So anyone who's above me, anyone who's got something for me, a title, a name, something like that, that's what we're aiming for. And uh, I think that's what boxers should do, aim up, not down. Yeah, I mean, you were looking before you got injured towards... Midlands area title in the Midlands just because you wanted to win it. Yeah. Do, is it now though that you're looking towards British level? Yeah, even that fight there, I wanted to let the kid have the title but I just fight him because he was an unbeaten fighter, had a title. But for me, I gotta be realistic now. I'm an Olympic silver medalist. Uh, British or onwards is better for me. You know what I mean? I think that's the level I'm at and that's the level I need to prove myself. May I ask you about um, your opponent? So Stephen Leonetto Dredage. I'd rather so, you say it than me. That's a, so that's a I, mouthful. I, if, I've, if I've absolutely <laughs> murdered that if I've, if I've <laughs> murdered that pronunciation, I can only apologise. So I saw him. I mean, you might be able to relate to this. I saw him at ringside at the Wolverhampton show, sat with Annie Taj, and they were sat in the wrong seats. And I thought, how have they ended up sitting there? And it only was relayed to me later on that it was him, that he had been around the area, that he had actually sparred with him. <laughs> he didn't he didn't rate the sparring, did he? He's come, he's come out and said that, that you weren't all that. I mean, which must hey, be great for you. It's great for me, but we'll, we'll, we'll see Sunday. We'll see Sunday. Uh, uh, I paid him good money. He's supposed to be down to the Monday. He got the call for bigger money. So if I was him, I'd take it too. What are you looking for from Ben? You know, you're working on the fight, you know, stay, stay very neutral, but you will have an eye on what we want to see from Ben. It's a high ceiling, so expectations are naturally high. Yeah, expectations are always high with somebody like him, but you just want to see, you want to see him nice and loose in there, nice and relaxed, um, injury free, and you just want to see him let his, his boxing flow, let that kind of subconscious flow state take over, and just let his punches go, because the ability level is there, we all know about that. And what's really important, I think, after the weekend is just to keep him, get him into contests that stimulate him. Somebody like him, he, he, he's got to have, sooner sooner rather than later, he's got to have people in there with him who put that little bit of knot of fear in him. Because without that, you're not going to get the best out of somebody like him. Because those elite level amateurs he was boxing, I was talking about how you boxed Kitchenyak in the Europeans and the World Championships I saw you in in 2017. Like, these are... You haven't been anywhere near anybody as a pro yet who's anything like that good, and that, that can be the problem, can't it? Yeah, you hit the nail on the head there for me. Well, give me may, one second. Maybe with the ADHD as well. If it's not challenging for me, I'll just stray off. And I think that's when you see me talking to Johnny in the crowd and things like that. I just have to keep myself entertained. But at the end of the day, that's why I'm getting the sparring. I'm getting this world class sparring. When I'm in Florida, I'm sparring people like Vladimir. This, I don't really know his last name, but Vladimir is he's in line for a shot with Canelo. I'm sparring people like that. So when you're sparring those champions sparring, it can still keep me as stimulated. You see, that, that's what I like because would, no matter what the public see, the real hard work you're putting in behind the scenes, people won't give you credit for, but you're making it look easy. So your opponents won't respect you. Uh, and the fans won't take it seriously, but they actually don't realise that how hard the work is behind the scenes, yeah, which, which, which is why you take most fights by surprise. You hit the nail on the head there, and I think at the end of the day, we know that what the end goal is. We want world titles, and it's about getting there at the right time. So, me, I've been sparring world champions, potential world champions. I'm doing all that now, so when I do get that level, I'm like, oh, this is the level. Oh, that's it. You know what I mean? I think if you're just sparring in the gym type of guys, then fighting the journey when you're supposed to topple over then you do get to world level you get found out so don't worry about what i'm doing in the gym i'm i'm, I'm it's not i'm 
training at a higher level than I should be, so then when I do fight these fights, I make them look easy. I, I was just saying to the guys when you were in the ring there, that I had a chat with you um, well, a few months ago now, and I was talking to you about you know, your, your kind of acceptance of re the realities of the ring, and you were explaining to me how you do those Cuban drills where you spin around and round and round and do roly-polies and then get back up and do the pads to replicate being knocked down. Because a lot of people look at someone like you and think, oh, he'll have this attitude that that can't happen to me, I'm invincible, you know, no one could ever hurt me. But no top-level operator actually thinks that, do they? You've got to tick every box. Um, there's no point in me thinking I'm going to go for my whole career unscathed. I want to, but you never know. You could catch a head clash, get a bit dizzy, and you've never been there before. So catching these drills, doing these drills in the gym, spinning around, looking at your finger, then trying to get your consciousness and shadow box. It might seem a silly drill, but I've been in tournaments where I've been head clashed. I've been a bit buzzed. I've remembered that drill, and I've called my composure instead of the opponent. So just got to tick every box. So when it comes, I've been here. I've tried this. I've done that. Perfect. I'm going to let you go. And just before you do, though, Tom, I don't know if you can. The footwear. <laughs> Yeezys. The Yeezys. Yeah, now, now, this might, now, this might shock you. I'm no no fashion guy. <laughs> and I was going to take a gamble on the Yeezys. But these are the Yeezys. Look at yeah, these. Yeah, Look yeah. at these. Dressing to impress. Always you dressing to impress. I nearly broke my neck in that ring. It's like the big crater in the middle. So I was like, jeez. But... Yeah, I didn't want to bring out the nice, sexy red boots right now. I thought I'd keep them, keep them under wraps. Yeah, I'd keep them under wraps, so why not just chuck these on? Uh, stylish, you got to do it right. Yeah, I mean, you are well, stylish. They look you a are. little bit silly, but <laughs> not at all. Them, I wouldn't tell you anyway. <laughs> Listen, you're, you're free to go. Thank you very much Thank for joining us. Much, much. I wish you all the best and great to have you back. Tremendous to have you back. He, one of the things about him is he is authentic to himself. So <laughs> you might hate him. You might love him, but it doesn't change him. He is completely authentic. And I think that that is what's going to be his USP. And what I he, he, he doesn't care what you think in terms of... What I respect in a lot of fighters is the fact that they're... What I respect in a lot of fighters is the fact that they're willing to go away from home in someone else's back garden and spar. Beat, beat and spar and beat, no matter what level they're at because they're always developing and learn. Most fighters don't want to do that. They want to stay in the comfort of their own home, sparring. I don't want to travel to spar. That's where most of the learning's been done. Well, he's here, the world champion. Welcome. Uh, how how are you, first off? It's uh, first open workout, like for us as a world champion, first fight week as a world champion. You've got it in blazing there. I made the, the comment that when you walked in, you got the WBO world champion bag. Are you carrying yourself any different, do you think, or do you still have that, that hungry sort of challenger underdog mentality? Or do you, do, actually having the belt, do you carry yourself as champion? And answer wisely, answer wisely. No, I, um, I'm, I look at the, be the belt means a lot to me, but when it comes to a fight and a fight week, I don't really, I just look at the opponent. And that's, um, the, that's all that matters is I've got 12 rounds against this guy and that's what, I've, uh, that's what I've got to focus on. So I feel supremely confident, but I did last fight week as well as a challenger. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I'm excited. You might not have an opinion on this, but I will ask you anyway. Forgive me. When we started, I just I watched your George Groves uh, interview, your Boxing News interview, and do you feel you're getting enough credit for fighting someone as dangerous as Mastanak in your first defence? Because a casual fan might look at that as a guy in his first world title fight who's in the, the last third of his career um, and who's always been the nearly man, maybe you're not getting enough credit for quite how dangerous this man is. Yeah, I mean, everyone's massively underestimating him in bookies and online, like, who is this guy and this? But he, boxing people know, we know in the gym, so we've prepared for the very, very best version of Masanek. And uh, you just heard it there, Mo chanting out all his previous titles. You know, he's been a nearly man. He, he's boxed the very best in the world. Um, I don't think he's ever been dropped. Um, so it's a very, very... To have 52 fights in boxing as a pro at Cruiserweight and never be dropped is a very, very uh, impressive um, impressive feat that he's done. But, um, you know, 53, uh, unlucky for, for him. Uh, that's, that's how I see it on, Saturday, on Sunday. May I ask you about any hometown pressure at all? So we love coming here. We've all, I would say, on behalf of Sky Sports... I can't think of a place we've been made to feel more welcome. People seem genuinely happy to have us here, which is which is unique. But, <laughs> you know, in the nice possible way, it's unique. But um, for, forever you were chasing that world title and you got it. Is there any extra added hometown pressure that there's an expectancy on you now? Or do you use that still? They motivate you. They're a 12th man in football terms. That, that it hasn't really affected your mindset in that regard. Like the crowd are your advantage and not your disadvantage. Yeah, ever. I'm... 
it, they're an advantage because there's pressure. I think uh, the pressure brings out the best in, in me. And um, I think if you're in boxing and you don't like or can't handle pressure, you're in the wrong sport because yeah. when you get to the levels that we're, we're at now, there's a, there's a huge amount of pressure and the whole town's been behind me. And um, I want to make them proud. And that, um, that's a huge pressure for me. And But uh, a privilege as well and one I'm, I'm really honoured to have. For a long time, you were looking upwards. Now you're at the top. It puts a big old target on your head and on your back. What, how are you dealing with that? The fact that everybody wants a bit of Chris Bill and Smith now. Fellow world champions, people that you've already fought, uh, the likes of Akoli rematch, the likes of Riak Paul, the likes of Opataya, they're all sort of calling your name now, which is must be brilliant for you. But are you able to block all that out or are you already in your head mapping out the next few stages? Yeah, map them out, you know, obviously not, not this week, but we, we, we obviously map out a plan and we always have done um, throughout my whole career. And um, there's always, you know, sort of the next step or the next two steps in in the background but I've got like like we spoke about a hard fight Sunday so I can't dwell too much on that and um but yeah it's um it's exciting time to be a cruiserweight on the, on the domestic and world scene because there's so many exciting domestic fights I've had a lot of them um I think I've boxed pretty much all of them now at, at the top level so um it's it, it's exciting to the time to be a cruiserweight and I'm, I'm honored to be you know world champion in such a great division before I let you go because we want to watch a bit of Mastanac here Johnny, have you got any words of wisdom looking back at your own career when you became world champion? What is the one thing that you would advise Chris uh, making a first defence? Is there any? Did it change you at all? Is there anything you would say? Make sure you thought about that. Looking back to me, being world champion, there's a responsibility. Your responsibility is is to own it. To say, there's all the other champions out there. You've got points there. You deserve this position. You fight like that, you think like that, you, you, you live like that. And when you go in the ring, when times are hard, when times are look easy, you will always dominate. But you've got to think, breathe and believe. Doesn't matter if anybody, nobody else believes it, believe you are the best. And once you believe it, it makes a completely different, different, everything looks completely different. I'm saying own it, own who you are. You've got the title, you've not got it by luck. Nice one. Thank you, appreciate it, Johnny. Yeah, no, uh, great words. And that's how I feel, I feel, like I've, all the hard work's been worth it and I deserve to be here because there's been a lot of darker times which people don't see and um, hard times and um, that people don't see and they just see the the announcement of me getting announced as world champion and think it's all been plain sailing. But um, I know I deserve to be here and I do feel like I'm the very best in the world. And uh, in, you know, in time, I'll get a chance to prove that. Good on you, best of luck. Thank you for coming and talking to us. Thank you. Okay, let's take a seat. Let's take a seat, guys, in uh, the master. Team master on the back of the t-shirt, Mateus Mastanak. What a servant to professional boxing he has been in a career that stretches all the way back to 2006 when he turned pro. I think Chris is right there. He has boxed all my, I think it was you that said it as well, Andy. He has boxed nearly everybody. He has been in there with nearly everybody. And even the sparring stories. I remember the Dillian White training camp over in Portugal. He was there for months on end and they did nothing but sing his praises. Said he is a hard night for everybody. It is his first world title fight though. Is he good enough to get over the line when it really matters? Because some people can go through the whole career and it just won't happen. That's true, but I think he's been unfortunate not to have had a world title fight because he boxed for a WBA interim against Yuri Kalenga in Monaco and he didn't get the decision. It was a split decision. I know he feels that he could have got it. And Kalenga then got an opportunity against Dennis Lebedev a couple of fights down the line. Pushed Tony Bellew to a hard, close, unanimous decision in late 2015. And his next fight, Tony got to fight for the vacant WBC world title. So... Somebody like him could have expected to have had an opportunity by now, but as I said right at the very start, no one's picked him for a voluntary during that period. And there's a reason for that, because he's lived a life. You look at the shape he's in, and he's lived a life all the way through. And he hasn't boxed that much since he lost to Julio Dorticos in the Super Series back in 2018. Six fights, but two of them have been taken down by beaten fighters. So I don't feel there's any particular deterioration with him. And as you mentioned, he's never even been down. He got stopped by Grigory Drodds, but on his feet. No one's ever, ever even had him over. Johnny, and it, this may sound a tad harsh, but it comes from a good place. Neither Chris Willem-Smith nor Mateus Mastanak are necessarily the most fluid 
of fighters. And what I mean by that is they're not, not particularly loose, but they're terribly, terribly effective. You look at Masternak there and you can see where he gets his success from, but you can also probably see where he gets his toughness from. He's got a real thick neck. Looks like he's got an incredibly hard head as well, is my uh, my expert analysis. I look at Masternak and I think I can, I can understand why he's the perfect sparring partner. I can understand why why if you've got a choice to fight him, you don't fight him. Not because he's so good, but because he's so strong, because he's so tough, because he'll make you work for it. So, and, and I look at it now, look at his stance, look at how he lets the shots go, I look at how, 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 how many gaps there are to pick him off. And if you've got the skill, you've got the cuteness, that'll beat him, or you've got to have the power to, to dethrone and, and get rid of him. So he'll give anybody a hard night's work, which is why I understand at a certain level, this guy will be an absolute nightmare. But I do believe at top level, when you come across somebody that's technically on point, he's beatable. Uh, I, I can understand why they'd use him as a sparring partner, because he goes looking for it. You want someone to throw the shots at you, you want someone that's in front of you, you want someone that's tough, that's not going to will. He's perfect. Yeah, I look at him, I think, I get it. I, I see why people like Dylan White use him as a sparring partner. I also see why he's probably not been given the opportunity to fight for World Heart, because you think, I've got either options. This is a good match for, 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 for Chris Billersmith. It's a, it's a really good match, and unfortunately, I'll say it again, Chris will not get the credit he deserves because this guy on paper, at world level, you know, it, 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 there's no argument. The, the argument's not there. I feel bad for saying it, but it has all the ingredients to be a brilliant, brilliant gruel of a fight. I think it could be quite brutal. Um, having watched Masanak, he's not the most difficult to hit. And he's probably saying the same about Chris. And you add all that together, and I just think, like, this this could be brilliant. I, I have a strong suspicion that it will be. I would be surprised if it's not a good fight. I think where William Smith has got the edge is in speed and agility. Now, he's not a fighter you look at and feel like those are two huge plus points for him against other opponents. But against somebody like Masternak, I feel that that... That is the case. He's quite rigid. He's quite stiff, Masternak, but we know that he is a very tough fighter. But I feel like Willem Smith should have the edge in those two departments. And I think a decent way to think about this, a decent way to look at this is if there was, this was for a vacant title, if this was Chris Willem Smith boxing Matthias Masternak for a vacant title, we would strongly fancy Chris Willem Smith in this fight. I think we would, and the fact that he's coming into this fight against him as the reigning defending champion with the boost and the lift that it gives you to your confidence and to everything, really, to your aura of being world champion. I think that Chris is certainly a favourite in this fight. And a lot of the time, you just need to ignore bookmakers' odds because it doesn't really mean anything. And whether he gets enough credit for this or not, in a sense as well, that doesn't really mean anything. I think it'll be good to watch. But I do expect Billy Smith to have too much for him. So looking at him, I'm looking, thinking like a fight. I'm looking at him. I'm thinking he's not good on the back foot. He's better. He's better. He's a better offensive fighter than a defensive fighter. So on the front foot, he, he's more dangerous. On the back foot, his his feet are not fluent. He's not. He's not. He's not relaxed. He'll block and defend going back, but he can't fight going back. He, he holds his hands like a, like a kickboxer where his elbows are out, he's, he's open to the body shots. But you've got to dumb him with those because I, I suppose a lot of people look at him and think he's easy to hit. You dumb it down the middle, turn it around the outside of the left hand, clip him with a, a sharp twist left hook. Those will hurt him, but he's tough. So you've got to, you can't go and try and get him out, out of there with one shot, you've got to beat him down. And uh, forgive me, you may have mentioned it while I nipped away, but uh, 52 fight veteran at 36. This is his last chance at this level, you would think. Unless something miraculous happens there, this is his last shot. Uh, he's our only and last shot at a legitimate world title. Unless someone's stupid enough and think, you know what, soft touch. Because that's how a lot of people get a lot of opportunities. You know, they think it'd be a soft touch. No, this is it. And, and, and that's, I think, why he is still very dangerous. And that's why it gives him an extra edge. Because he'll know this is it. He won't have expected this to happen. He's drifting towards the end of his career. And one of the other reasons why he hasn't boxed that much in the last five years is because there's not any particular reason why you would fight him other than to think that he would be a good name you could get on your record. And a couple of undefeated fighters have clearly fancied their chances there. They've both come up short. 
so he wouldn't have thought that this was going to happen and now it has happened his attitude surely Johnny will be Chris Billum Smith is an absolute mug what was he thinking he, giving me this chance he look at Chris and think this is the easiest opportunity I've got in the world title but looks so deceiving Chris is tough he's determined he's dogged and he can bang and, and, and Chris looks at him I was just we were just talking off uh, uh, off, off mic there I said, look at the openers there. They know the openers are there. They know, they know, they know he's beatable. But you know, this guy, he'll make, he'll make a lot of money as a sparring partner. He'll make, a, make a lot of money just on the fringe. But I just believe when it comes to world level, if Chris is worth his salt, he should get rid of him. But it'll be a tough night's work, and he needs the credit he deserves if he gets pulls a win off. But, but if you think about it in terms of motivation for Masternak, we, we had a long conversation about this a while ago. And if you're Masternak, surely you're, you're, you're you're getting that chip on your shoulder by looking at Billum Smith and just thinking, oh, okay, I know, I know what the plan's supposed to be here. Yeah. I know what the script is here. How dare you think that you can just invite me over and look for an at easy defence? And he's brought a team over with him. Let me just pause you there. So Mateus is going to come and join us. Andy, if you do Mateus's uh, microphone, and I will do Darius, the translator. Darius, I say translator, but part of the corner team as well. Who is it? No, not us. Not us. Not us. Not us. Not us. Uh, if you tell Mateus, he can do my short answers and short translation. Mateus. Great to see you over here. Tell us how you're feeling now ahead of your first world title fight. Thank you. Everything is good. I feel good. I feel ready. I think it's my time. Special time. Uh, so, and then you. Wow, look at this answer in English as well. Thank you very much. May I ask, I got sent a newspaper report from your local newspaper that said that you were the laughing stock of your village when you told people that you were going to be a world champion. How do you feel now that that's just a few days away, that reality? Mateusz, tutaj była wzmianka w lokalnej gazecie, że jesteś z mojej wioski i pewnego dnia powiedziałeś, że będziesz mistrzem świata. Co, co teraz, jak się do tego odniesiesz w ogóle? E, moja droga jest piękna, bardzo długa. Szkoda, że nie gadam po angielsku, bo Myślę, że wszyscy byście tutaj płakali. To jest gotowy film na Oscara. My journey is so um, beautiful, so long. It's pity that I'm not uh, speaking English well, because it's a perfect screenplay for an Oscar. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a ro ro what Rocky number are we on now? It's like Rocky 10, maybe. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. Maybe. No, please no longer. This is Mateusz Mastenak. Mateusz Mastenak's story, the, the, the man here to spoil the party. Before you go, how do you think you beat Chris Billum Smith? Does it matter? Is it points? Is it knockout? Can you can you knock him out? Uh, I, uh, I think will be great fight. Very very great because I'm ready. I'm strong. I'm tough guy. Uh, my opponent is too size. And every fan watch this uh, evening because. I think it's an amazing night. Do you have a message for all of your fans back home in Poland that can watch? You can say it down that camera there. What's your message to everyone at home? To wszystkich Polaków, powiedz po polsku wiadomość. Do Polaków. Tutaj patrzę się z kamerą. Trzymajcie za mnie kciuki. Mateusz Masternak 17 lat czekał na tą szansę. Ten pojedynek dedykuję dla każdego dziada, pradziada, każdego pra pradziada. My, Polacy, jesteśmy wojownikami. Pokażę wam wszystkim, jak wy kiedyś walczyliście za naszą godność, za naszą wolność. Teraz będę chciał oddać wam hołd w postaci pasa mistrza świata. And the new! Can you give us a gist of that? Yes, fingers crossed uh, the, the 10th of the, uh, December. I'm going to show everything. I'm going to fight for whole generations and you're going to see I'll be the new champion of the world. Brilliant. Love your passion, love your energy. Congratulations and best of luck. Thank you very much, Darius, as well, for coming up and helping. Good luck. Great energy there, guys. Wow. You know what? I love... Uh, I love... I love I, I've said it to you before, Andy, and I'll say it to you, Johnny. There is nothing better than a, a chaotic translation when um, <laughs> when, he, when he's really pumped up. But fair play to Mateus for coming on live there and doing uh, as much as he could in English there. I know I, I play the clown a little bit, but I really do appreciate that because it, it, help, it helps us. But... If we thought he was coming here and not fancying it, that's blown, blown out of the water, hasn't it? I mean, he, 
he is. I, for a man that I, I haven't seen that animated previously, really up for it. Now, he, he, to me, and we were just talking about exactly this, he, he's got the look of a man who, in a way, can't believe his luck that he's been given this opportunity. And I'd imagine the last few weeks, he's been getting up every morning just thinking, just please phone, do not ring telling me that this isn't happening or that hasn't been an injury. I suppose he's, it's deli like he's delighted that, we, that he's here now, that it's fight week and that this is actually happening because I don't think when he got the call originally, he could probably quite believe it. You know what? David Hayes said that about when he got the call to fight Audley Harrison. He said, I cannot believe I've got all that in his head because they, they know each other, they knew each other. He thought, this is a soft touch. Master Nat might be thinking the same. He might be looking at looking at him and realistically, he's got every right to because as they say, look, he's had more knockouts than Chris Bill and Smith has had fights. So he knows experience-wise, tops him. Um, uh, Durability-wise, tops him. I mean, experience-wise, as a sparring partner all over the world with the best, tops him. So why wouldn't you think this is a gimme? Why wouldn't you think that? Just look at Chris Billon Smith here, uh, just doing a few core exercises and warming up. I mean, he is like chiseled out of rock, isn't he? He is, he is Iron Man in that respect. They both are, though, aren't they? Yeah, they, they, both, they both are. are. They both you know, cruise, are. Cruiserweights are typically in, in, in incredible shape because, generally speaking, they're, they're heavyweights who train hard. I mean, that's how people describe them often. And, and Chris Gay yeah, is in fantastic shape. So is Matthias Masternak. Neither is going to be found wanting physically uh, when it comes to stamina, strength, any of that kind of thing. And, and I agree with Johnny. I think that this is one of those fights where down the stretch it could come down to that most old-fashioned of battles, which is who can break whose will first. Although when he stood there talking about um, injuries and stuff like that, his eye looked great. You know, that was a big concern after the Akoli fight. That took a long time to heal. Mm. They gave it a long time to heal, crucially. Um, but it looked fine, Chris Bill and Smith. It, it was a, I remember in the post fight interview, I was looking at it, and Robert Smith said to me, don't keep him long. And I was like, with respect, Robert, there's 15,000 people waiting to hear from him. But I could understand Robert's concerns. It was one of the worst cuts I've seen in a long time. Not for the length, but it was so deep. Uh, but it's healed really well. Whoever did the work on that, congratulations to them. It's, it really has healed well. And I'm just trying to get my head down around why, why, why would they pick this guy as your first defense of your world title? Unless they know something that you don't. Nah, well, I just, when I read it, honestly, I read it and I thought, is it somebody else or a, a, another master knight or has this guy really gone backward? And then do, you, look, do you remember doing the Bellew fight? Yeah, how difficult I do. that was? I and how, how much um, that win has grown? from Tony yeah. it's, I, I like wins like that that they get better with time yeah. and actually Tony Tony did really well that night because Masternak has gone on to prove that he's a real handful yeah, you could, I mean you can make an argument that that was his best win yeah 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 that, that, that's incredible isn't it yeah looking at Chris now Chris I, I he doesn't look like he's struggling for the weight at all because this, at this stage if you're struggling for the weight any kind of workout you're wrapped up because you want to try and yeah, sweat it out you won't take your top off would you he won't take your top off he's very comfortable he's probably probably Two pan, two pan, three pan. Over, we don't want much physical difference when it comes to weighing on Saturday. Yeah, I mean, we're critical when we need to be, I think, and we also heap praise uh, when we should. And I think Shane McGuigan, in his words as well, one of his greatest achievements is Chris Billum Smith. That's not to say that Chris Billum Smith doesn't work hard, but to graduate through the levels that they have. I think Shane puts it down as one of his greatest uh, trainer fighter achievements. And I, I would say you probably go, go far to try and beat that. Brendan always said, if you're, if you're a coach and you produce one champion, people will say it's luck. And I mean, talk, produce it from scratch. Uh, and that's when you get the credit for it. You can always get a made fighter and polish them up. But if you produce one from scratch, then, then people say it might be luck. When you start producing two and three from scratch, then the people will give you the credit and respect you deserve. So Shane is saying he's his, 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 his biggest achievement for that same reason today. I made this kid from this from start to be to, to the end to this point here. So this is why he says it's his greatest achievement. We just saw Chris um, flicking out that left jab there. For all of the talk of the toughness and the grittiness and uh, how brutal it could be. Although it was a brutal fight against Isaac Chamberlain, it was probably the Billum Smith fundamentals that won him the fight, which was a really, everything came off a very good jab. He has got an underrated jab, probably, uh, in, that, in that respect. And you sense that for all of that talk that I've just mentioned, boxing fundamentals will win the day in this fight as well.
Yeah, absolutely. You know, you look at his amateur career, he's a good, solid amateur, got to some ABA finals, wasn't far away from that GB squad. And what he does is just work very, very hard in the gym all year round. And it's a really easy thing to say, and it should be a straightforward thing to do, but, but it isn't. That kind of dedication is a skill and a talent in itself. When we talk about talent, we're generally thinking about this God-given kind of ethereal ability to do things better than other people. But the ability to dedicate yourself and commit yourself completely to the way of life, that, that is a talent in itself. And I wouldn't be surprised if we do see him get on the jab ball. We did see that against Zhou Zhai. It was a bit of a shootout. Yeah. Thoroughly, thoroughly entertaining. Yeah. Kohli was a different kind of fight because we knew it would be, and they knew Lawrence very, very well. So they prepared for him in a way that nobody else really could. But you have to make use of whatever natural advantages you have. And the natural advantage he has over Masternak is the reach that comes with his height. You know what makes me laugh, Johnny? You work all your life to become world champion. Dream about it, achieve it, believe it. Chris Billick Smith didn't have his world title with him earlier. Ed left it at home and had been too busy to go back and get it. Had it on the, because you can see Shane McGuigan with it now, uh, had it on the mantelpiece for about a week, but then got embarrassed when people came round, so put it under his bed. <laughs> Your WBO titles, the first one ended up in a, in a drawer yeah. at Sky, and you forgot where it was, yeah. and then the diamonds fell off, and then Paco sent you a new one to Vegas when we were out there, and you, taught, you bought it home. Do you remember where that ended up? <coughs> under the it? bed. Yeah. Well, well, there's another one then because there's one above the there's one above the stairs no, in Sky Sports. No, I know where it is, but the thing is, when you you change that, you want the belt, but then when you get it, it's not about the belt. Because I'd be wearing it, yeah. I'd wearing it, I'd be wearing it every day. It's not about the belt. That's why I, I, I say that my, my British title, my, my Lonzo belt, was under the bed. My European belt was under the bed, and um, for the short space time when I had the, the, the WBO belt, it was under the bed. You think, what can I do with it? Do you feel a bit? I don't know a bit in your face. Yeah, it's not, it's, and I understand. It's when you finish, you appreciate it. Uh, but at the time, you think, I've done this now. This is, this is my bad one. It's interesting, actually, because on the night, he, he left the stadium with Lawrence's belt. There wasn't a new one for him, so he left with Lawrence's belt. He kept Lawrence's for a bit, but then had to basically give it back to Lawrence because it's, it wasn't his. And then wait for the WBO to send him his, his own belt with his own name on it and all that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's quite interesting what can happen on that score sometimes because I heard him on George's podcast, George Groves' podcast, and he said he felt like he described himself as feeling a bit muggy having to give Lawrence <laughs> the belt back. But, you know, he, he, because it's kind of, it's like, oh, well, I won this off you, but never mind, you can have it back now because I've got my own coming. But that's just, you know, the logistics I, I remember, of it all can be quite I, exciting. I remember when I boxed Carl Thompson. And um, and they gave him the belt in the ring, and he sent one of his boys into that dressing room, snatched the belt back, and there was a big eye would take the belt back. And I, I, I it, 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 because you think once you've had it and you've lost it, you think, all right, it's important to me. But when you win it, it's not that important because you think officially it's in the record book. I don't care. That's what it's all about. It's when you lose it, it becomes important. WBO, he was saying, sent him a full tracksuit. It wasn't just that bag. They sent him a full WBO World Champion tracksuit. And again, you know, the kind of guy he is, he said that he didn't really feel like putting it on straight away, wandering around Bournemouth in it, because it's Listen, just not really him. I, I went to a convention in Las Vegas, and they gave me a, a gold ring, a big gold ring as a gift. I, I couldn't wear it. I had it in my pocket. I just felt, I felt like, <laughs> I felt like some, some I, I, I felt bad. Let's just pause here because the fighters are going to go face to face. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our main event live this Sunday on Sky Sports and NBC's Peacock Around the World. 12 three minute rounds for the WBO Cruiserweight Championship of the World. Mateus Masternak versus Bournemouth's own Chris Billum Smith. Live Sunday night at the Bournemouth International Centre. There we go, Big Mo setting this up. Sunday night, six o'clock, Sky Sports Arena. 12 rounds or less. Chris Billum Smith will defend his WBO cruiserweight belt against the challenger from Poland, Mateusz Masternak, live in Bournemouth. Ladies and gentlemen, this event is sold out but you can still watch it live on Sky Sports and Peacock TV.
There you go, a fist bump to finish it. So that was set up perfectly. Sunday night, six o'clock, Sky Sports Arena. That's what gets it underway. And then the main event, as you just saw there, Chris Bill and Smith against Mateus Masternak, a pre-Christmas cracker. Make sure you join us later in the week. All of our fight weeks streaming, all of the uh, fight week events streaming on Sky Sports platforms. So make sure you come back tomorrow to join us then.